Welcome back, it's Peter Ballas, your cardiologist. Now, today's topic is all about stents and these little devices that we use to open up blockages in the arteries around the heart. So we're gonna talk about what they are, what does it mean if we do have one, and how do we look after them? Now, there are many of you out in the community that have had stents, and I have a lot of questions being asked about what are these stents, what are they made of, and how does it affect my body once the stent is inside. So today we're going to focus on these devices and why they are used, and what are some of the things you should know about. So stents are put in through a procedure that we call angioplasty, and this is a procedure that we undertake when we perform an invasive test called an angiogram and we've had a separate topic on what an angiogram is so please uh, do go back and have a look through the, the videos on what angiograms are but these tests are picture tests using x-rays to visualize the arteries around the heart to look for any blockages or narrowings that may happen as a result of the buildup of cholesterol or this fatty material called plaque. Now that can develop inside the arteries of the heart and obviously the arteries around the heart serve a very, very important role. And what they do is they help su supply nutrients to the heart muscle to allow the heart muscle to beat as it does you know, 70 times per minute, delivering nutrients and blood and oxygen to all our body. But of course, if there is a buildup of this cholesterol plaque, then you get less blood flowing to the muscle and that can cause symptoms and you might have heard of a term called angina and that's typically a condition whereby you might have some tightness in the chest going down the arm up in the jaw which can happen as a result of exertion or pushing yourself climbing upstairs going up inclines but blockages can also build up rather abruptly very suddenly in the form of what we know as a heart attack so placing these devices in called stents can be life-saving in that situation. The coronary stents are placed through a procedure called an angiogram where we place a little catheter, a little tube, often through the, the wrist artery, from there advance some catheters up to the heart and inject dye, visualizing the arteries, looking for any narrowings. If there is a significant narrowing, and potentially if this is you know, typically more than 70% or so narrowed, there is a consideration for using these stents to open up the artery, to prop open the artery and then restore blood flow. Now it's not the first thing we do uh, when we diagnose somebody who might have these blockages depending on the clinical scenario there might be tablets and medications and just lifestyle factors that your doctor might recommend but in some patients it can be very useful to improve symptoms that they might be experiencing and their quality of life by placing one or multiple of these devices called stents to open up the blood flow and restore blood and oxygen and get into the heart muscle so it can do its own thing. Placing a stent is used to treat buildup of plaque around the arteries of the heart and thereby improving blood flow and reducing symptoms. Now, placing a stent is not for everybody and discussions with your doctor are paramount here and your cardiologist to look at whether the stents are the best thing for you. Do you need to have a stent firstly or is there an alternative therapy, of course medications and lifestyle changes addressing your risk factors, but also whether coronary artery bypass surgery may be more appropriate for you. And we're going to have a separate episode on exactly that in terms of what is bypass surgery, how is it performed, and why might it be useful for you. Traditionally, stents were not the first thing we started implanting in the arteries. And when we started developing what we call intervention, and that's what I am, an interventional cardiologist, which essentially means I have had formal training in how to tackle the arteries and how to unblock the arteries using these stent devices. But we traditionally used to put a balloon in, simply 
popping a balloon through the catheter that we do an angiogram with, opening up the artery, squeezing the cholesterol open. But unfortunately, just placing a balloon itself means that the artery and the plaque buildup develops rather quickly. So it wasn't a long-lasting procedure. And that's when stents arose. Stents came around because we used to find that when we placed a balloon to open up the artery, the results were not long-lasting. And we thought, well, something needs to be there long-term to actually restore blood flow and actually keep the artery open. Traditionally, stents have been made of metal and you might hear of various alloys such as stainless steel, cobalt, chromium. And these metals are very, very thin devices, sometimes even 60 to 70 microns thin. And these act like a spring, like a scaffold that goes into the artery at the site of where the blockage is and opens the artery up. And you can imagine by opening the artery, we restore proper blood flow and symptoms improve. Or if there is a clot forming in the artery as a result of a heart attack, the stent can treat that area, open the artery and restore blood flow, thereby minimizing any long-term damage to the heart. Now, stents are traditionally made of metal and there are two types of stents that you may have heard. One being a bare metal stent and another being a drug eluting stent, or a DES. Now what does that all mean, and why do we need these various stents? Well, again, the bare metal stents were the first generation stents that were developed. Essentially they were made of a metal, like a spring, that was used to prop open the artery. But what we found with bare metal stents is that over time, the body was often unhappy having this device inside it, I guess a foreign material. And sometimes there would be a reaction or a, a type of healing response where the body actually even tries to reject the implant or the stent. And that can cause a process known as restenosis or re-narrowing inside the stent, thereby developing more symptoms because of a repeat blockage. More worryingly is also a complication called thrombosis or stent thrombosis whereby the cells in our blood that are traveling through the artery can clump on the stent and develop an acute clot causing a blockage inside the stent. So of course there have been many changes in design of stents, in the materials of stents, in how they behave and perform inside an artery to look at reducing all these risks of stents long term. And about 2002 and 2003, we started implanting these newer generation stents at the time called drug eluting stents. Now the difference between a drug eluting stent and a bare metal stent essentially means that we had the same material, same stent, same metallic scaffold. However, the stent was coated with a immune modulating drug and that drug is released over a period of a few months into the bloodstream and into the artery wall to reduce the body's reaction against the stent. So you can imagine, it's like an anti-inflammatory drug that is coated around the stent, which reduces that reaction and reduces the likelihood that your body will reject the stent or there will be re-stenosis or re-narrowing inside the stent. So that was a very, very major advance back in 2003. And the stents since then have continued to evolve and to develop into what we have now, the latest generation stents, which are made of various metallic alloys. They are very thin, they go nicely into the artery, and they give us long-lasting results. But you might hear that after you've had a stent in, you are asked to stay on blood thinning medication for a lengthy period of time. We traditionally use aspirin, and that's one that we often use for life. And aspirin is a blood thinner that reduces the risks of clots forming inside the arteries, but also inside the stents. But we often find that aspirin is insufficient to help reduce the risk of clots forming inside the stents. 
Now we often combine it with a different type of blood thinner, which is a little bit stronger than what aspirin is, but used in combination. And one of those medications you might have heard is called clopidogrel. That is a blood thinner that we use. Another one is ticagrelor. And these are newer generation types of blood thinners that we use to reduce the risks of complications developing inside the stents, particularly in the first six to 12 months as the body is getting acclimatized to having the stent inside. But over time, what happens is our body forms a nice amount of tissue to cover the stent. And that means that the blood traveling throughout and inside the stent is not visualizing any bits of metal in the artery wall and it's less likely to cause a clot formation as a result of trying to reject the metal stent. Now stents are continuing to evolve and that's one of my key areas of interest in my research. I work across medicine and also biomedical engineering and we are looking at what are the best types of stents for our patients into the future. Which stents are going to be better for patients? Which stents might have less complications for patients? And which might be more compatible with the body? We've been looking at various materials, not only metal stents, but the newer generation stents potentially made of magnesium. See that the magnesium over a period of 18 months to two years actually breaks down and dissolves potentially leaving nothing behind. So that's where I believe the future is going at a slow pace with our research. There are other devices we are working on that are made of polymers or plastic type materials rather than metal stents. Now we know that the metal stents are typically there for life. With polymer stents, these stents open the artery up, but over a period of a few years, potentially there's a role that these stents will dissolve break away, leaving the artery open, and that's really what we're looking at in terms of future research. There have been a few generations of these scaffolds or stents that have had some promising um, trial clinical data. However, the first generation, perhaps uh, we're still learning a bit about, were associated with some slight increased complications. So now we're looking at second, third, and fourth generation scaffolds that potentially into the future well, will form the mainstay treatment for patients. Now, when we place stents, we size them depending on your artery. Some of our arteries are large and typical size being about three and a half millimeters in diameter to four millimeters in diameter. But the arteries have curves, have bends, are larger in one section than another. So at the moment, our stents are pretty much on the shelf with fixed measurements. So they come in 2.5 millimeter diameter, 3, 3.5, 4, 4.55 millimeters in diameter. And the lengths can vary depending on the size that you need to treat for a particular blockage. But they are typically standard lengths, 12 millimeter, 16 millimeter, 20 millimeter, up to, you know, 40 odd millimeters of stents, so four centimeters long. And sometimes we do need to use long stents to treat quite long parts of an artery that have got a lot of cholesterol. But I guess what's, what excites me in terms of my research is, well, how do we actually tailor the stent or customize stents to fit individual patients? All our arteries are unique. No two arteries are the same. So we're looking at some very exciting applications of 3D printers and potentially taking very clear images of, of an artery and these laser type scans that uh, we use potentially could then provide us with an exact custom design that we could then print prior to implanting into patients. So that's, again, that's not being done at the moment. That's purely a research uh, avenue, but certainly holds a lot of promise in something that my team is working very, very strongly with across both in Australia, but also with international partners. So when you have a stent in, the treatment isn't done. We have to maintain the stent, and that's really the paramount importance here of trying to control 
the underlying risk factors. Now these risk factors, and as we've covered in previous videos, include high blood pressure, including high cholesterol, smoking, weight or being overweight, inactive, diabetes. These are key cardiac risk factors that we know if we don't control, problems will again develop both in other parts of the artery but also inside the stent. And there is a rate or a risk of complications developing inside stents that they can re-narrow, clog off, and that's why it is important that we do control risk factors. We do remain on a key number of medications. Now again, I'm an advocate for minimizing medications, but we know that once a stent is in place, we need to be on a few medications long term to maintain blood flow within the arteries and stop the process of buildup of cholesterol developing again. Now there might be blood thinners, as I mentioned aspirin, but there's a different type of aspirin that we often use in combination, typically for 12 months. But then there are cholesterol medications that we know have a dedicated impact on reducing the amount of cholesterol building up in other parts of the artery. But also we've seen new research emerging that cholesterol can also develop inside stents, a process known as neoatherosclerosis. So it's a process that we're learning a lot more by using these 3D images or scans inside the heart and the arteries to see that over time, cholesterol can actually build up inside stents. So it's paramount importance that we do work on those risk factors. Nicotine smoking, cholesterol, diabetes, blood pressure, keeping them all in check. Now after the procedure, depending on how you've presented and if it's not been an emergency, then often you can go home the next day. There is also some data to say that in certain situations, depending on where the narrowing is or where the blockage is, and depending on the level of support that you might have at home, there might be an opportunity for you to go home that evening. But typically we usually stay the night. If you're presented in an emergency situation, whereby there might be a diagnosis of a heart attack where the artery has been abruptly closed and we've got to get in there uh, at any time of the day or night to open up the artery, then you're often in hospital for a few days, being monitored and having your medication changed and monitored just to, uh, to get you um, fit and strong recovering and uh, probably go home after a few days. So again, hopefully I've given you some insights into what these stents are, why they are used, and obviously the key factors are trying to minimize the risks of stents failing or complications building up or new blockages developing. So thanks for joining me and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Bye for now.